So welcome to the seminar of the Sonia Stani Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Today's speaker is Chris Enninger. Chris was born in Florida, was educated in Florida, and got his master his BS at University of Florida, then moved to Georgia, where he received at the Georgia Institute of Technology his master in 2006 and his PhD in 2008. After his PhD in 2008, he moved to Carnegie Mellon, a little bit colder environment, <laughs> where he became a postdoctoral fellow working at the Center for Atmospheric Particle Studies uh, under the leadership of Professor Alan Robinson. So we're very proud to have Christopher today. Christopher, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about organic aerosol. And specifically, I'm going to talk about closing the gap on missing sources of organic aerosol in the atmosphere. And this is work that I did as part of my thesis at Georgia Tech. So let's start by talking about uh, defining aerosols and talking about some of the properties of particles in the atmosphere. So aerosols are simply solid or liquid particles suspended in the air. And to remain suspended in the air, which they can for weeks, they have to be small. And they are, although you can see here that uh, in the atmosphere there's a very wide range in particle diameters that are observed, over five orders of magnitude in fact. Um, aerosols are ubiquitous and they're also quite numerous. Okay, I would guess that in this room there are somewhere on the order of 1,000 to 10,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And that's a, a pretty standard concentration range that's observed in a, in a lot of cases, in a lot of, in a lot of locations. Um, aerosols come in um, a number of shapes and phases. Uh, this seems to have frozen. Um, so anyways, they, they particles come in a, in a number of shapes and phases. And they have lifetimes that range from hours to weeks, with the average uh, lifetime of a particle in the atmosphere of about one week. So it's not advancing. There's been a particle within the system. <laughs> Escape it. So I just talked about that. So, okay, so why do we care about particles in the atmosphere? Well, there are a number of motivating factors, including detrimental impacts on human health, uh, implications for climate change, visibility reduction, and important effects on atmospheric chemistry. And I'm going to spend a few minutes now talking about some of these motivations in a little more detail, uh, starting with aerosol effects on human health. So this shows data from the original Harvard Six City study from 1993, along with updated data from the same six cities. And what this shows is a normalized mortality rate on the y-axis and a PM 2.5 mass concentration on the x-axis. And each of these uh, letters, each of these symbols represents data from one city. And now PM 2.5 refers to the mass concentration of all of the particles smaller than two and a half micrometers. And we care about these smallest particles. And the EPA actually regulates particles in this size range because these smallest particles can penetrate into the deepest portions <coughs> of our respiratory system and can cause adverse health effects because <coughs> of it. As this figure shows, there's a, a strong relationship between mortality and PM2.5 concentrations. What is the time window for mortality? the time window for mortality analysis. Yes. Um, there are different ways that this is uh, done from an epidemiological standpoint. Uh, I think that maybe the next figure will, will helpfully uh, maybe address that. Words, how do you know that this is really uh, a correlation one to one? Yeah, that's a, that's a good uh, question. The epidemiologists uh, go through great pains uh, to make sure that the variable that they're controlling for is in fact uh, is in fact observed. 
in other words, controlling for variables like smoking and socioeconomic status and things like that. They, take, uh, they go through a, a lot of effort to make sure that what they're analyzing I is, in fact, you know, the effect they're seeing. And so this tells, uh, these two figures tell a similar story, but in a different way. And so the figure on the left shows life expectancy circa 1980 as a function of PM 2.5 concentration. And each of these data points represents a city. And so again, we see the negative relationship here, lower life expectancies at higher PM 2.5 concentrations, consistent with the previous figure, with both of them indicating that these particles kill people. Um, not to get too dramatic on you, but it's, it's true. And so the figure on the right also shows life expectancy uh, as a function of PM 2.5 concentration, but now for a period about 20 years later. And in this 20 year period, life expectancy in the United States increased. Um, and so these figures are on different scales. So I've tried to line them up so that you can actually visualize the increase in life expectancy. And so certainly there are a number of factors that have contributed to the increase in life expectancy. Right? Advances in modern medicine would headline this list. But this study, which was from the New England Journal of Medicine, um, <laughs> uh, okay, I can from from the previous figure I can tell you that. Uh, okay, it's not letting me go back. Um, from the previous figure, I can tell you that the the worst was Steubenville, Ohio, and that was the S, and the best was a small town in Wisconsin. Um, so for what that's worth. Um, so, uh, sorry. Okay, so so. There are lots of reasons for the increased life expectancy. But this study from the New England Journal of Medicine has concluded that, all right, it's frozen again on me. Um, how, did you, how did you get out of it last time? <coughs> it seems to not like my, my animations. Okay. Sure. Okay. So the study concluded that 15% of this increase in life expectancy was due to reduced air pollution, reductions in this PM 2.5 concentration. And that's something else that you can see from these figures. So in each of these figures, there's a red dotted line at about a concentration of 15 micrograms per cubic meter. And this is the EPA's current annual limit. It's, it's, a, it's a national air quality standard, and you can see that Around 1980, most of the cities were exceeding this 15 microgram per cubic meter concentration. 20 years later, many more of the cities were actually below this concentration. But this figure is now you know, 10, 12 years old, so it is somewhat dated. Uh, this is a map showing the most current data from the EPA, showing counties in the United States that did not meet the annual uh, PM 2.5 standard of 15 micrograms per cubic meter. So there's a lot of white space, and it might not look that bad until you actually focus in on the areas that were out of attainment. Um, and it's not surprising <coughs> that urban areas dominate this map. Okay, so you know you've got Milwaukee <coughs> and Detroit, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, where I live, uh, this highly populated region including Philadelphia, New York, and much of New Jersey. And you probably all have noticed that our most populous state is, is not faring so well either. And so what this means is that about a quarter of the US population is living where the air quality is unhealthy. Now, air pollution and air quality are not by any means a US problem only. Um, in fact, the, the problem can, the situation can be much, much worse in the developing world. In countries like India and China where the pressures of economic development often far outweigh environmental considerations. And so this is just showing a, a metric of air pollution in Hong Kong. And you can see the striking increase over the past 20 years that have largely correlated with uh, eco intense economic development. And there's a phenomenon that you may have heard about in Asia called the Asian brown cloud. And it's, a, it's an annual occurrence and you can see here this satellite image from NASA. And I, I hope the resolution is okay, but you can see this cloud 
uh, here. It's obviously visible from space. And this is not hay, this is not um, fog, and it's not clouds. This is pollution. And uh, to give you a sense of the scale, this right here is the Korean Peninsula. And so this cloud of pollution is covering a significant portion of the eastern coast of China. Okay, so aerosols <coughs> impact people's human health, and, and they're a global problem. We also care about aerosols. This is not an animation. Are you running, <laughs> um, are you running it from the flashlight? No, no, I took the flashlight out. I was running it from the desktop. Alt-Tab whenever it goes up. Okay. okay. Alt-Tab. Okay. Um, so we also care about particles due to their effects on climate change. Okay? And aerosols affect climate predominantly through two mechanisms. The first comes about because these particles directly interact with solar radiation. And this is the so-called aerosol direct effect. Now, some particles, such as black carbon, which is also called elemental carbon or soot, <coughs> absorb solar radiation. And this imparts a net warming effect on the climate. Other particles, such as ammonium sulfate <coughs> and certain organics, scatter solar radiation. And the scattering of solar radiation imparts a net cooling effect on the climate. Now, due to certain ab abundances of different aerosol types, the aerosol direct effect has a net cooling effect on the climate. Now, the other way that particles affect the climate comes about through the way that they can alter the properties of clouds. And this is the so-called aerosol indirect effect. And it's, it's pretty complicated. I'll try to explain it with using a simple example. So we'll consider a rising parcel of air, just a rising air mass. The, the ground warms and, and the air rises. And when the air rises, it cools. And when the air cools, the water vapor wants to condense onto particles and make clouds. And so we're going to consider two different situations. We'll first consider this air mass to be relatively clean with respect to particles. And so we have uh, not a lot of particles in this air mass. And so when this parcel rises and the water vapor goes to condense, there are fewer particles onto which this water vapor can condense. And so we end up with a cloud with fewer cloud droplets. On average, these droplets will be bigger. And so this cloud is more likely to precipitate. It will have a shorter lifetime. And we end up with a cloud with a lower cloud albedo, meaning one that will reflect less sunlight back into space. So if we contrast this to the same rising parcel of air, but we now consider it to be polluted with respect to particles, the amount of water vapor that we have to distribute is the same. But now we have more particles that they can distribute on. And so we end up with a cloud that has more cloud droplets. On average, these droplets will be smaller. And so this cloud has, on average, a longer lifetime. It's less likely to precipitate, which itself has a lot of imp important implications. And we end up with a cloud with a higher cloud albedo, meaning more sunlight is reflected back into space. This is a, a figure from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And it shows all of the factors that impart a climate forcing effect, including these two here, which were the two aerosol effects that we just talked about. And the thing that I want to uh, highlight here is the uncertainty that's associated with all of the terms. And we can see that the largest uncertainties out of all of the factors that we know contribute to climate change, the largest uncertainties are the two effects associated with aerosols. And so what this means is that if we are to truly understand the effect that people are having on climate change, we have to do a much better job characterizing a lot of the properties of atmospheric particles. Aerosols also affect visibility. Okay, This is not fog. This is a, a pollution event in Atlanta. And this is just a typically hazy day in the Appalachian Mountains. Aerosols affect visibility because they scatter radiation, right? the aerosol direct effect that we just talked about. Now, I guess compared to effects on mortality and compared to climate change, effects on visibility might seem rather trivial. But there are a lot of people who care a great deal about the effects of aerosols on visibility. Um, the National Park Service, for example. So when people pack the family up in their station wagon and drive across the country to go see the Grand Canyon or Mount Rushmore, they get very, very upset 
if their view is not pristine. And so the National Park Service has put a lot of money and a lot of research into aerosol effects on visibility. Okay, so those are some of our main motivations for studying aerosols. Uh, we're now going to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, some, some properties of particles in the atmosphere. And we're going to start by talking about the chemical composition of particles. And this is a really busy um, figure. What it shows is chemical composition, the, the, the legend is down here, but the chemical composition measured at a lot of locations around the world. And so it's, it's really busy, but the <coughs> thing that I want you to focus on is just the green portion of each pie. And the green portion of each pie represents organic compounds. And it's nothing chemically specific, but it's the sum of organic compounds that are in the aerosol phase. And what we <coughs> see is that these organic compounds at, a, at most locations around the world are the largest fraction of aerosol mass. So as, as the title of my talk indicated, it's these organic compounds that, that my research focus on, focuses on. It's these organic compounds that, that the rest of this talk will focus on because of uh, their, their abundance in the atmosphere. And so we can broadly classify organic aerosol into two groups based on how these compounds get into the air. Um, the first are compounds that are directly emitted into the atmosphere already in the particle phase. And you can think of these as direct tailpipe emissions since these particles are literally emitted from whatever their source, they are emitted already in the condensed phase. And these compounds are collectively called primary organic aerosol or POA. Now the other class of compounds are those that are emitted into the atmosphere as a gas, as an organic gas. And these gases undergo oxidation to form oxidized VOCs. And these oxidized VOCs have a vapor pressure that is lower than the parent compound. And so some of them will partition, will condense into the aerosol phase forming organic aerosol. And these compounds are collectively called secondary organic aerosol or SOA. And we know from the standpoint of the global organic aerosol budget that concentrations of SOA are, are much greater than concentrations of POA. There are a number of sources of organic aerosol in the atmosphere, including biomass burning, secondary formation from VOCs that are emitted by vegetation, uh, transportation, motor vehicle emissions, industrial emissions, and then some other less important sources, for example, oceanic sources. Okay, so we know that organic aerosol makes up a major fraction of the aerosol mass around the world. And we know that SOA concentrations exceed POA concentrations. And we think we have a handle on some of the major sources of organic aerosol in the atmosphere. But uh, with all of that being said, we have a pretty significant problem. And that is, uh, state-of-the-art models tend to fail miserably in predicting SOA concentrations. And the bias is always negative, meaning the models are under-predicting SOA concentrations. And this is true for laboratory studies. Uh, this is from uh, my current group at Carnegie Mellon, although before I got there. And they did a study. They took exhaust from a diesel engine and put it into a large Teflon bag called a smog chamber. And they exposed these emissions to artificial UV light, artificial sunlight, excuse me, to UV light. And when they did this, the organic aerosol concentration increased. You can see these white circles are, are what was actually observed in the change in the organic aerosol concentration. Now, at the same time that they did this, they were also measuring the gas phase compounds that we think are most important for SOA precursors. And when they did that, they were only able to explain this red wedge here, a very small portion, something like 10% of the organic aerosol that actually formed. And the, the story is basically the same for measurements that are made in the ambient atmosphere. Okay, this is a figure that shows the ratio of the measured SOA concentration to the modeled SOA concentration for a number of locations. These are a number of different field studies. And you can see that, again, the models are significantly under-predicting SOA concentrations. What are the vertical yeah. bars for? Why some vertical bars? Uh, um, 
I, some error bars or, or a range. So for example, range. these um, measurements will be made over like a course of weeks or different locations, and so it's the range by which at different locations in this study. Um, and so um, as much as it may seem that this is the case, this is actually not an indictment of the models. Um, but rather, the systematic underprediction of SOA concentrations demonstrates that our knowledge of the processes and the sources of SOA are far from complete. And so because these compounds are so abundant, there's been a lot of research in recent years as people are trying to close this gap. And there have been a number of hypotheses put forth to explain the missing SOA. Uh, some of these are based on actual data, some of them are not. But I think the major hypotheses include cloud processing, uh, low volatility organic vapors, incorrect SOA yields. These are based on uh, individual single component experiments in laboratory smog chambers. Uh, unknown VOCs that people are not presently considering, incorrect emissions inventories, and uh, aqueous phase processing by small particles. So I should say that these hypotheses are not mutually exclusive. And given the large gap between measurements and models, it's, it's possible, it's I guess perhaps even likely that some combination of these will explain fully that gap. Uh, now I guess you may have also noticed though, my name is next to this one. Uh, this is the one that I'm going to be focusing on. Uh, however, before I get into an explanation for this missing <coughs> source of SOA, there's, there's one complication, there's one more problem that we have to talk about associated with this topic. And that is the chemical complexity of the organic aerosol. And so one of the major limitations to making measurements of organic aerosol is this, this chemical complexity. So in the atmosphere, the organic aerosol is comprised of thousands of individual organic compounds. And these compounds have widely ranging chemical and physical properties. And so because of this, a complete characterization on the molecular level, that is being able to say, these are all of the compounds that make up the total organic aerosol. It's not possible with current analytical technologies. Uh, in fact, what's much more likely is that we can apportion about 10% of the organic mass to individual compounds, and the other 90% is not known. And about 10 years ago, um, I think people were hopeful that we would get to a, uh, a, a complete characterization on the molecular level. Uh, and I think that view has largely shifted now. And I think a much more common approach is for people to make measurements of bulk properties of the organic aerosol. And in making measurements of these bulk properties, you lose some of the chemical specificity, but you gain a comprehensiveness because you're able to characterize a greater fraction. And so I think the two most common approaches are measurements made with an aerosol mass spectrometer by aerodyne, and then measurements of the water-soluble fraction of the organic aerosol. And this is the, the technique that I'm going to talk about. It's what we used uh, for this study. And so our approach is to measure the water-soluble <coughs> organic carbon, or WSOC, fraction of the aerosol. And so in general, we know that VOCs undergo oxidation to form SVOCs, or semi-volatile organic compounds. And as I said, some of these can partition to the particle phase forming SOA. Now we know that SOA is oxygenated, and thus it's water soluble, at least on the, the, the concentrations that we are looking at. And so if we measure the water soluble organic compounds, then we have an approximate measure for SOA. And we took this approach one step further by measuring the water-soluble compounds in the particle phase and in the gas phase, we're able to say something about the partitioning of these compound, compounds and hopefully gain some insight into the formation of SOA. And as I said, in taking this approach, we, we lose uh, some chemical specificity, but we gain a comprehensiveness because we're able to characterize a greater fraction of the 